Hello, welcome to this episode of Musically Cogitating, a podcast about the relevance and importance of living in contemporary music of all kinds and about how that music impacts our everyday lives. I am your host, C. Odd Wells. Thank you for joining me here on what is yet another Wednesday. And as always, any important and relevant links will be linked in the show notes. Today, I have an interview with Joshua Marquez. Joshua is an incredible artist and composer and person and lover of baseball. And we've been collaborating and working together on several different projects and some things that will come into the world over the next several months. So I'm really excited about that. You can be on the lookout for those things via our personal social media channels and things like that. We had a really wonderful conversation about music, about life, and about olives. So I hope you enjoy this interview with Joshua and myself. Welcome, Joshua, to the the podcast. If you could uh, start with who you are, what do you do, where you live, what you like to eat, any of those things. Uh, so I'm, uh, my name is Joshua Marquez and I am a composer, guitarist, and I mean, I guess you can call me a sound artist to an extent that I do some pretty, uh, uh, analog style, old technology music installations with tape and reel to reel and cassette tape and, um, other kind of installations like that and sound design things. Uh, but primarily a composer and a guitarist, uh, an improviser. Uh, currently I live in North Carolina, but that is, I'm in the middle of a transition. Nothing is set in stone yet. So I don't want to, I don't want to like put that onto the world, but, uh, could be somewhere new in the next couple of months, hopefully fingers crossed. Uh, so I, I pretty much freelance is in terms of my day job. I freelance, uh, I play like theater gigs, uh, doing musicals or like kind of sound designy things. Uh, occasionally, although film and other kind of development things have shut down a little bit since the pandemic, I'll do some scoring for media projects. Uh, and before the pandemic as well, I was able to uh, kind of get a couple of commissions per year. But again, a lot of live performances went away. Now they're coming back. So I'm, I'm are, yeah. you know, fingers crossed that those kind of pick back up. And then I teach lessons and I teach composition every summer uh, in South Bend, Indiana for a couple of weeks. So I kind of piecemeal everything together in the classic gig economy, freelance musician, freelance composer world where uh, some some months it rains and pours and some months I'm in a severe drought. But as long as I can even everything out and, and try to make things work, then we're good. Um, where I like to eat I mean, again, during the pandemic, it's been uh, at my kitchen table. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm a vegan, so I, I really like... Oh, you are? Uh, okay. Maybe yeah. you said that. Okay. Maybe... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Mm-hmm. So I like any kind of vegan, e- any vegan goodies. Um, so do you like I, olives? I'm actually not a big... Ol- I'll eat okay. olives, but I'm not like a snack. I, I don't like snack on olives or anything. Okay. That's like a... That's, that's a question I like to ask everybody. Because there's like this uh, theory that two people in like a romantic relationship, like both of them can't like olives. There's always like the one person in the relationship who does and the one person who doesn't. And I despise olives and my partner likes olives, but I'm just like My partner likes olives too. But I'll eat them. Like if they're in something, I'm not going to turn away, but I'm not going to open up a jar and be like, yeah, this is awesome. No, like if they're on like... So I'm vegetarian. If and if I like ever go somewhere and they're like on a sandwich or on a wrap or pizza, I just flick them off. I'm like, oh I yeah, I I can't. I just I don't know. I don't know. But uh, yeah, olives. Olives. Yeah, I like on a vegan pizza or something. My partner's always like, let's get let's get olives, and I'm like, all right. <laughs> it depends because some some places will put a lot of olives and some will put just a few. I can do the few if it's a lot. I just like. I flick them off too. Yeah, yeah. They're just, but uh, the taste isn't, it's not awful. It's just, I'm not excited about it. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, yeah, no, I'd never, no, no, olives, no olives for me. <laughs> um, so I, I would like to hear about and learn about your foray into your career in academia 
as a as a musician, as a sound artist, as a composer, teacher, and I believe that you did your doctorate in Iowa. Uh, I did, I did, and I want to know what that was like living in Iowa. Oh, living in <laughs> Iowa was weird. Um, you know, I'd never been anywhere that cold ever, so that was like it wasn't as much of a culture shock. I think mm. people are people are people, and you can learn to navigate. Um, culturally, Iowa City is pretty cool. It's a college town, so I mean, it's not like it, it had its own. It has its own identity in terms of like a city, but it's not. It's not like it's you know. It, there's there's nothing shocking about Iowa City for me, at least. I had some 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 like racial incidents in Iowa City, um, but uh, it was just really cold. I loved the University of Iowa though. It had great funding. Okay. It was a good program. I adored my mentors and instructors and, and advisors. I thought they were wonderful. Uh, I mean, there was there was positives and negatives about the program. Um, but I believe that whatever program you're in, whatever you put into it is what you get out of it. So if you go mm -hmm. in and kind of coast, you're not going to get as much out of it as if you really kind of push and put in a lot. So uh, I tried to take advantage of all of the opportunities that I had there. And I think that's you know, why I think I had a good time. Um, it's because I kept busy. So I could maybe I was just so distracted that I didn't pay attention to anything else. <laughs> 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 that's yeah i mean that's 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 one way to to go about it i guess yeah what what made you decide to pursue the doctorate because I, I think we all have our reasons and i think they start out similar but you know finishing is very different from starting <laughs> i'm learning yeah so you're you're finishing up at uh university of georgia right yeah i'm I'm 70% of the way done is what I like to say. You know, sometimes it's 69%, sometimes it's 70. So. But you're like ABD? Yeah, I am. Yeah. So you're you're like, you're like 90% done. You just got to do like one thing. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. It's a yeah, big the, thing. The biggest thing one... of my life, but yeah. So yeah, the, the biggest thing of my life, I had a, a, a professor on my committee and he's a really sweet guy, but uh, he couldn't make it to my defense and he... I'm not going to put him on blast and put his name out or anything because I, I really liked the guy. And there were a couple of like, oh, that was kind of Ed, like iffy mm -hmm. uh, with, with things he might have said. But uh, he didn't make it to my defense for, for a specific reason. And so he emailed, I guess it was like the dean or something, the administration, that he was going to pass me without um, any reservations. And he says, I'm going to pass Jose Martinez for, and so like, in my in my portfolio for like my my certification like i have mm -hmm. a generic hispanic name that's not my name um love the guy though i mean you know people 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 are human so yeah it's fine yeah. um but finishing yeah i wanted to get out of there i finished it in three years coursework Ooh. and and defense uh i just had to get out of there not because of iowa city or anything i mean there were issues but um I was just burned out, you know, so throughout my entire higher education, I don't want to say career, but higher education journey, everyone was like, go to grad school. Then when I got to grad school, they were like, go get a doctorate. And then I went and got a doctorate and they were like, okay, go teach. And like, there was no, there, with, with some exception, there was no, go out into the real world and like be a composer or go out into the real world and be a musician. And I feel like the majority of people that I've talked to and friends, peers, colleagues, whatever you want to call them, that have gone through a similar or the same system all feel the same way. They're like, I want to teach. And I'm like, but, and I'll have students that are undergrads, um, not in an institution right now, but like I'll, I'll do Skype lessons or I guess Zoom lessons now, and I'll do um, like summer teaching and stuff. And I'm like, you're, you're a sophomore. Like you don't, you, you can want to teach, but you've never taught right like not even high school and like maybe if you teach high school you're like oh, i don't want to teach k-12 i want to go teach college that's fine but um we get indoctrinated that like this is the pinnacle and this is the one and only thing is oh, yeah. yeah you teach and i think a lot of undergrad programs are like we're music education focused go go teach high school or middle school band orchestra choir uh, or teach like elementary school music which they're all very valuable and those are great those are tough jobs and all the people I know in those jobs, uh, they're wonderful human beings. 
and and those jobs don't need to go away like we need we need music education k through 12 but then once you get into grad school it's just like a lot of people flexing like oh i got this oh i'm gonna teach there oh i'm adjuncting and i'm just looking at the salary and like i've adjuncted around and it's just not i'm like i'm not gonna sit there and hop from small town to small town to small town doing sabbatical replacements visiting assistant professorships adjuncting at three institutions for less than fifteen dollars an hour when you like add it all together yeah i, and, I did and you work more yeah. than 40 hours you just yeah. do yeah i did that for a year like the adjuncting thing and i was like wow this is what i'm supposed to be you know working my life towards and i was like no i need to do something else <laughs> i need like a real job with like benefits and like you know time at night and like all of these other things and it's funny that you bring up kind of what what does music school teach us and prepare us for because I've been in lots of conversations where especially on the internet I, I think people are like music school is supposed to teach us how to open uh, Ableton and how to set up a band camp and and how to do promotion and marketing and I want to ask you is that what you think music school is supposed to teach us? I won't get into specifics, but I think music school should evolve. I don't think it's evolved since like 1950. Okay. I'm not trying to throw shade. I mean, like we learn Max MSP as composers. Uh, we learn Pro Tools. Like, you know, see, if, you, as if a... you do electronic music, yeah. but you learn academic electronic music, you're right. not learning how to mix and EQ a drum kit. I mean, we did to an extent, like we had some education in that, but it was like, okay, how do we make this like, uh, uh, you know, like a John Cage piece? You know, how do we take this percussion thing and make it like this electronic thing? How do we stock house in it? Um, and like, that's great. And I value it. And I, I mean, I do a lot of that kind of like weirdo stuff, but the majority of music being made right now isn't that. The majority of music, especially if we're working in a studio setting, because you were talking about Ableton and, mm -hmm. and Pro Tools and stuff, um, you're going to be mixing drums, you're going to be mixing guitar, you're going to be mixing electric guitar and acoustic guitar, and you're going to be mixing vocals, and you're going to be doing like, you're going to be using Melodyne to to fix, you know, auto tune, <laughs> you know, and you're going to be filtering things. And these are, we learn the weirdo concepts, and they're very similar, but we don't know these specific things, unless you go into a music recording or a music technology degree or like a music industry studies degree, which they do offer. Right, um, right. And those are great, but we don't learn the skills of, I don't want to say we don't learn the skills of marketing because we do to an extent. I think a lot of the peers that I have become dependent on the system. Okay. So okay. Yeah. you become dependent and I'll speak as a composer. So the composers that I know, they go undergrad, master's, doctorate, if they go that journey or whatever permutation of, of that, if they take some years off. But they're so dependent on being a student or faculty <laughs> to get the resources, i.e. musicians and ensembles. And a lot of my friends or, or, or colleagues or whatever, and, and this isn't putting them on blast or anything, but like when I was a student, I tried to get over 50% of my performances outside of the academy. Or if if it was still in an institution, it was at not my home institution. So that when I went on land after being at sea for the better part of a decade, <laughs> I had my land legs. You know what I'm saying? Right, I could walk right. on my own two feet and not have to rely on the institution and be dependent. And that's why I think so many people finishing their doctorate or even their masters or bachelors are so desperate for academic jobs because that's all we know and that's all we're taught. And we're dependent on that as the survival method where there's so many more opportunities to work as a composer um, or a musician or, or even music education outside of that traditional institution. And we have to kind of, um, I liken it to decolonizing your mind and your music when we put this thing on a pedestal and we see that as the pinnacle, we can't value ourselves if we uh, operate from without, if we operate externally from it. And so we beat ourselves up. And I remember the first year uh, was, was, I finished in 2016 and I had applied the year before when I was ABD and I might've gotten one interview. I knew I wasn't gonna get anything, but it was mm -hmm. like practice. Well, the next year I got a, several interviews, Tinker Track, but I remember staying up all hours of the night working on my applications, dozens and dozens and dozens of them, working on my portfolio, working on everything. And not to be graphic or anything, but I would sit there at my computer with a wastebasket on my lap because I was getting so sick. Um, 
and you can put two and two together. Yeah, I, was, yeah. I was sick for days on end for like the, for an entire several months span. And of course there was the election that happened that year oh. and the fallout of that. And we can get into specific incidents of me sitting across a table of all white people of a certain age being completely awful to me um, in interviews for tenure track positions and me just, that was, that was the last year I applied to things to a lot of things at once. Right, I've applied right. to things like one off, like, yeah, maybe. And I kind of like put a little stock into it, but I'm like, whatever. Like, I know I'm not going to get it, but <laughs> I feel like, I feel I'm still kind of decolonizing myself. I feel like obligated to do it. I'm like, <sighs> right, right. Yeah. I was on higher ed jobs.com the other day, you know, typing in guitar. And I was like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, there's not going to be anything here. Not anything close to me. If it is, it's going to be like a one hour, one hour position three hours away from me where I live in Austin. And I was like, this is not worth it. And yet I was still looking. So I I understand. Right. Right. Um, I would, and if you don't want to talk about this, uh, feel free to say, see, I know. Um, but you know, what was it like to sit across from those, those tables and those conference rooms and have those interviews? Like, like were people just like grilling you about your music? I mean, do, I've always wondered, like, do search committees even listen to people's music or do they just read this and they say, oh, I've heard this name before. Hey, have you heard this name? Oh, yeah, I know this person. Let's pass them. Because I feel like that's mostly what happens. But uh, honestly, I, and I don't want to speak and say they don't listen to music. Right, right. Or that they do. I think it's completely dependent on the committee. Mm-hmm. But in the several that I've had, uh, there were two examples that really stuck out to me. One was at a pretty large state school. Uh, I mean, not like a, a super big program, but big enough. And I interviewed for tenure track, assistant professor um, in composition with, it was either technology like with it or theory with it, but primarily composition. And so I interviewed and three white men, two white women on the committee. And the very last question that was asked of me is, not by the committee chair, but one of the other members. And he says, our student body is 87% white. How will you relate to our student body? And I give him, and I'm in like professional mindset. I'm not like spitting off the cuff like I am with you right now. So I was very professional. I was like, well, I treat everyone equally. And that's true. Like, I'm not going to treat somebody differently. I'm going to treat them all like human beings because that's what we all are. And I don't, I'm uh, to, to quote, um, I think Ice-T might have been the first to say it, but don't, don't hate the play, I hate the game. Yeah. You know, like, if you have unearned privileges and advantages, I'm not going to be mad at you. You didn't earn those in the same way that, like, you and I have unearned disadvantages. Mm-hmm. Nobody should be mad at us. I'm mad at the system, but this 87% of the population, I'm of uh, the student body population, I can't, I didn't give him this answer, clearly. Right, right. But I'm not, I'm not angry. I'm going to treat them equally. But my, internally, my job was on the floor. And I was so thankful that, that was the last question. And I left there and just cried. And it was just awful. The other instance was, uh, first thing they said to me was, well, okay, so you're the diversity candidate out of like three, maybe four. And I'm just going, like internally, I'm going, well, I didn't get this job. And I was like, and if I did get the job, <laughs> it's so that they can virtue signal and be like, yo, we hired this brown kid. Um, and, and I just... You know, I, I, I was as professional as I could be. I mean, maybe my face looked a certain way. Maybe that was a test. I think that's a stupid test, mm-hmm. uh, if that was a test. But, um, yeah, I mean, the, the music questions were fine. They weren't really specifically geared toward me. They were like formula, formulas, right? Like, right, right. what are you going to do here? What are you going to do there? I, I I don't think they care... <sighs> I don't, I don't want to paint with a broad brush, but I don't think they care specifically about your aesthetic or your technique or anything. They want to, yeah, they want to know if you can teach it. And I mm-hmm. think your aesthetic and technique do reflect if you have an understanding of it. But at the same time, if you can just regurgitate some modernist quote, you probably are going to get the job over me because I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not going to be like, well, you know, Boulez said... Um, and they don't want people to challenge. You know, at the end of the day, right. they don't want anybody to challenge the system. And I believe in challenging the system. I think the system is broken. And I think somewhere along the line of my academic career, and I'm putting that in air quotes for those that aren't, you can't see uh, me doing that. 
But through my academic career, I slowly either became really jaded or just realized that this system is broken and it's not meant for people like me um, with exception. There's always exceptions, but right, right. there's too many gatekeepers and that gatekeeping um, may be changing with, with race and gender identity and sexual orientation and things like that, but it's not going to change right now with class and oftentimes race and gender identity and sexual orientation are tied into economic uh, class. And so if you don't have a certain income level or you haven't passed a certain X, Y, or Z, you're not going to have the credentials to get there in their eyes. And so they're looking at a reduced pool of applicants. Um, I, I totally am meandering. I don't know if I'm answering your question at all. <laughs> you, you totally did. Yeah. And okay, I'm, I'm, you, you said so many things in there that I was like, oh, yeah, like finally someone else. Uh, who's like thinking about these things or, or, or considering them. How do you talk to your students that you have now about this? You know, for your students who are like in high school and they're like, you know, Joshua, I want to be a composer when I grow up, <laughs> you know, and they're like, I want to do the the whole route, you know, finish the PhD. Are you like, yeah, are you encouraged? I assume that you're still encouraging them, but I, I could also think that you're being honest with them about what it, it's really like for those students, especially if if they are uh, brown and black and if they are of a gender minority or marginalized identity? Yeah, it just depends on the, the individual. Um, mm -hmm. If somebody's gung-ho and just set on doing something, yeah, encourage it. If they're open and honest, like, I don't know if I want to do this, present both sides. You know, I, I, I value everything I've learned. I valued my time in education. I valued all of it. I don't value the system that doesn't work. And if they go into it expecting a certain thing, whether that be positive or negative, that's not good. You have to go in open. Um, but also understanding there's not a path. There's not one path. There's not a stepping stone to stepping stone to stepping stone that's going to get you to your goal. You are going to get you to your goal. And you have to value that. If you want to score for film, list off your favorite film composers and then tell me what film school they went to or excuse me, what like film scoring institute they went to. Dollars to Donuts, they didn't go to a film scoring institute. But they got, they got lucky or they were extremely talented or they had a connection or something that got them to that point. That's what we have to foster and nourish. But if you want the education, go for it. I was watching an interview. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar or maybe the listeners are familiar with that uh, show and like Instagram page and YouTube, uh, All Gas, No Breaks which is no, now Channel 5 News. It's this guy named Andrew Callahan who does like some, he's very sincere, but he does like comedic interviews with like fringe people. Like, <laughs> you know, like he went to a white, with Channel 5, the, the newest video he put out was at a White Lives Matter rally. And like, <laughs> you know, like he goes to like Juggalo conventions and he goes to like, like, like uh, he went to Burning Man, which was really funny. Uh, but then he also did like the George Floyd um uh, he he went to the Minneapolis uh, uh, protests in the in the fallout of George Floyd, and then he went to the the um, the conviction of of Derek Chauvin too. And those were very sincere and heartfelt and beautiful interviews that he did. But anyway, I was watching an interview he did with Vice News, uh, like a twenty minute, thirty minute uh, bio bio uh, of him, and he said, you know, I went to college and he goes, you don't really learn a lot in college. He went for journalism. He goes, mm -hmm. but it forced me into a regiment and a routine and gave me a platform and opportunity. I'm paraphrasing, but he gave me a platform and opportunities. And that's where I learned. And then when I left, I learned a lot more. And I feel like music school is the same. Yeah. You learn the skills by doing. It's the old 70% at home, 30% in the classroom. It should be that way too. Like all the skills you learn, 70% are going to be at home or in your field and 30% are going to be like in the classroom, in the lesson, in the wherever, you know, in, in the lecture hall, you know, <laughs> concert right, hall. Right, right. Yeah. Someone would, I was telling someone one day that I was like, yeah, I don't think people go to music school necessarily to learn chords or, or, or whatever kind of technical knowledge. I think you go because it gives you time. It gives you time to get better it gives you the four hours a day that they say that you need to to practice every day for hours on end, for days on end, for weeks on end 
to to get better and then you know there's kind of that process of osmosis too you're around all these people you go to all these concerts and eventually it just starts to kind of set in but I I don't think that you have to go to music school if you want to be a performer or or successful in music in any way I just think that it, it has become a way for us to get there if we want to but we shouldn't diminish anyone or or devalue anyone who doesn't want to to do that experience but still wants to have a successful career in music i also think it's a way to validate we go to music school Mm -hmm. to say like oh i did this i'm educated in music and you know for me it was like with my family like i didn't tell them i was a music student the first year I was in music school. <laughs> what did they think you were doing? Uh, so I applied. Technology. I applied to a bunch of colleges, and uh, I applied as like a history student, like history okay. education. Um, so I got into I got into Duke, and then I got into a couple of the state schools. But then I looked, and I went to Campbell University for my undergrad, which is a private university. But I was looking, and I was like, okay, do I go to the best school that I got into, which was Duke, for forty thousand a year, roughly? I was like, uh, I can't get that. Or do I go to the the private school, which I think was 28,000 a year, but I got enough scholarships to make it less than every public school I got into with any kind of scholarship I got there. I was like, I'm going to the cheapest. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I did that in three years. I did my four year degree in three years. I got in, I got out. Oh my gosh. And um, because I did summer school and I did like overload classes, but I, I told my, my family, I was like, yeah, I'm studying uh, history. And so I drove out to, and I auditioned without them knowing uh, and I was like, I'm doing a, a music scholarship audition. So I was playing bassoon and guitar at the time. So I went out with bassoon and I went out with guitar and they were like, okay, here's the money we can offer you. Uh, if you're a music major, here's the offer we can offer you as a music minor. And here's what we'll offer you just to play in like these ensembles. And I was like, I'm taking the music major stuff. So uh, they didn't know for the first semester and a half that I was a music major. So good. Uh, Cause I was, I, I was a huge disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, but it was a way to validate. I think once they saw and they were like, okay, well, you got this cash to do this. All right, that, that that's okay. Um, I didn't want to go to school. I didn't want to go to college at all. I mm. wanted to open up a record shop. Oh, jealous, yeah. Which, you know, I went to college in 2008. That was my first year. And of course the recession happened. So I was like, oh, you know, thank God I'm in college. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or like, oh God, this is awful I'm in college. But um you know, now record shops are hot. Like they're, yeah. they're big money now. Um, so I'm like, ah, look, I could have had all of this. You could, you could have. You I know. just listen to music all day. You still um, can too. Like, I, I think like, I'm sure wherever you move to, there'll be an opportunity for you to, to open up that, that record shop. I don't have money to open day. up a record shop. I know. I don't know how people, <laughs> how people do that. It, when I, and whenever I go into like, you know, uh, some kind of media, digital media or like small shop, I'm like, how do you do this? Like, how do you have money for this? But it's always the same kind of people running it, right? Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, you know, know what, what I'm getting at. Yeah. So that's how they, that's how they are like, able to do it. But Those trust funders. <laughs> oh, it's a hot take. Don't at me. Don't at me. Listeners, don't at me with that. You know, if you've got it, use it. There's nothing of wrong course, with that. Of course, of course. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But uh, don't, I, I encounter so many like middle-class fancy people that grew up with like a hundred, their, their parents combined income is like, you know, over 150, uh, 2,000 square foot house with a two-car garage and maybe an above ground pool. And they're like, I grew up poor. And I'm like, no, you didn't. <laughs> like, come on. I lived in like a small two bedroom, you know, like growing up with with drug dealers next door like that's that's and i don't even consider myself to be like that poor when i grew up you know i was like it's okay <laughs> yeah, right right I way think, poorer you know yeah yeah i think that the internet no i'm not gonna put that on the internet i just think that because of our recog- recognizing of a recognition of privilege some people are, are uncomfortable sitting in their privilege and they they just don't want to acknowledge the truth. Like, if you live in that kind of you know middle class family, which which I totally did. Like, I'm totally here to recognize and acknowledge all of the privilege that came and that continues to come with my life. And I'm not ashamed of it. And I think I am. I hope that I can be in a place in a space in life to help people 
aspire to do what they want to do <laughs> because I yeah. have the privilege that I have and I, you know, but there's nothing wrong with privilege, right? You right. know, it's how you use it and how you, um, I don't know how we got on. I don't know why I brought that up, but I brought it up for some reason. It was good though. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, we'd use the term like white privilege. Right. And a few years ago, I encountered the term un, undeserved it, white advantages. And I really liked that hmm. because when we say privilege, we think of like a brat. But when we think of an advantage, we just think like, oh, you have a little bit of a leg up. And, um, you know, like income privilege or like financial stability. There's nothing wrong with those terms. Um, I think a lot of people try to downplay it because we have this bootstrap mentality where like, right. I earned everything I did. It's like, well, yeah, you did. Even if you have a trust fund, you've earned it. You just might have been able to pay out a little bit to get a little bit more. Um, and, it, you know, you were able to get a little bit ahead. And that's right. there's nothing wrong with that. I just want more people to not struggle to get to your starting line. Right, exactly. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah, we can we, we can move on from that if you want. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll talk about like income inequality all day. Good. Um, uh, speaking of bootstrap, I know that you produce and promote and share a lot of your own music yourself. And I want to know why you've chosen to go that route. If that was a conscious decision, what do you think you gain from doing it all yourself and you know, what do you think you lose from doing it all yourself? That's a good question. Um, I think it was necessity. You know, I, I've had music, like concert music released and recorded and released on other labels. I don't like have a label per se. Like I, I really don't, but I just self-release and um, self-promote, which is, it's a skill I learned as a composer on my own. Uh, somebody once told me, I can't remember who, but they were like, you'll never be discovered sitting in your living room, writing a score and putting it, filing it away. You have to put it out there. So you either have to cold call people and see if they'll perform it, or you have to put your music out there. And that's where I think, um, I just, I had to do it because I was like, I have so much music built up and just sitting here that doesn't have an opportunity to be, to be out. And we have this beautiful platform among others like spotify mm -hmm. which i love and hate and because it democratizes music right and anybody with little technical skill can release music which is a pro but a con is also anybody with little technical skill can release music and there's no gatekeepers which is great you know uh, 40 50 years ago the gatekeeper would be like a record exec right, right. who's who's decide who's a tastemaker and so they're being flooded with demo tapes and then they're going this is good this is bad this is good this is bad this is bad this is bad uh and then from there you move on to getting the funding to go into the mega studio to and then you get the promotion and all you're still working for all of this now we are our own record exec we are our own pr person we are our own um yeah, recording engineer maybe we send it out to a mix engineer or a mastering engineer or something like that maybe we send it out to people promoting it label labels are still vital they're just not as essential like they're not right right you can circumvent that you can just move right on past that if you want or you can still go that route so um for me I, i'm still open to to working with labels i've just especially in the classical world, like contemporary classical music, it was like, okay, uh, give us $2,000 and we'll do it. And you give $2,000 and you're like, okay, am I going to get this back when you sell? And they're like, no, we're only making 150 copies and we're not selling them. We're just giving them to you for your portfolio. So I'm like, I, I mean, I could have bought $2,000 worth of recording equipment and hired and, and done a full CD and printed it with disc makers or, or something like that. And no, 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 not throwing shade. Like some people want to do that. It's easier. Mm -hmm. It's streamlined. You know, I'm still open to it. I'm just, you know, and, and now that I'm performing more, I can, I mean, not with the pandemic, but I can have my, my merch, my, my tape. I do tapes. I do, I haven't done any like digipacks, CDs or anything, but I'll do tapes. I have vinyl, um, that I've recorded with a band, have that available and you can sell it cheap <laughs> and make, you know, a little bit, you know, I'm not trying to like, be greedy or wealthy or anything, but um, you can help sustain yourself that way. Yeah, yeah. 
and you have a little bit more artistic control, but you also have to put a lot more effort in on the front end. You know what I'm saying? Like you have to be your own designer. You have to hire a designer. Like you're kind of a work contractor or you're kind of a, uh, doing it all yourself. Uh, so it's, it's tough, but it's, it's for some people. It's not for some people. And, and labels are still very, very crucial, but not essential. But I know you've talked about um, like wanting to do a label of some kind. Maybe I'm not trying to like reveal anything if you haven't made it public. No, I think I've said it. Okay. Uh, good. <laughs> I, I, at least I, yeah, I'm pretty sure I've said it on the internet many times. Um, and you know, before we were recording, I came up with an idea and I was like, oh, I know what I'm going to release, you know, and like all these things. But I really wanted, I really wanted to be an opportunity kind of like with all of the things that I do for people to feel like they're supported in their artistic decisions and their voice. And so taking away the, you know, you need to pay me two grand and we'll do all the pressing and promoting, but just being like, you know what? We like you. You're interesting. We want to support you. So here's the space to record and here's someone to, to mix it and master it. And, you know, we'll make you a few tapes and CDs and, and we'll share it for you and, and we'll help you do all of that. And that's where I want to be as like a record label exec. I don't know. Um, you know, be, to just be helpful. I don't, I don't want to necessarily be a tastemaker or, or anything like that, but I, I understand all too well the struggles of doing it yourself and feeling alone and not wondering if anyone's listening or does anyone care or how do you even do this? And, you know, that's, that's kind of the goal and my hope with that project in the nearer future. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's what I believe in, in general. Yeah. The, you're really talking about like community yeah. driven stuff yeah. where it's collaborative. And I think that's where you see a lot of success. And at the end of the day, we don't, I don't have magnum opus complex. I'm like, this is the greatest thing. I need to produce it and have it have, you know, 1000 limited pressings on vinyl. That's like whatever with, with, you know, uh, sparkles on it. Um, you know, I'm like, I'll do a limited 25 tape release. And if I sell out, I can do 25 more, um, uh, you know, whatever it's, it's, it's fluid. It, there's a lot of fluidity and a lot of collaboration. You know, I'm working with several people right now on collaborations to do recordings and stuff. It's, we, we need to, I think academia treats us to have a crab mentality. Hmm. Uh, if you've ever heard of that, where. Oh, like in the bucket, you're in the bucket. and Yeah. And the crab pulls down. And that's because we see things as like a piece of a pie. And if I get a bigger piece of the pie, you're like, I get less pie. It's like, no, there's, there's like, there's limited pies, but there's really like a lot of pie out there. Right. So just because I get a piece doesn't mean you don't get a piece. If you help me get a piece, I will help you get a piece. And and not in a quid pro quo, well, what did I say? Not in like a quid pro quo way, like a back scratchy way, but like if it's community oriented and, and cooperative, um, then we can, we can all succeed. And I want to see all the people that, that are my friends and, and musicians that I work with and composers that I work with and artists that I work with to, I want them all to succeed. And I hope mm -hmm. that they want me to succeed in some way. And, um, I think both of us are trying to build communities that are uplifting and not com com competition is a good word, but a bad word. Right. I right. want to be competitive in that I want to push myself. And if I hear somebody make a really great recording or a piece or something, I'm like, ooh, I want to be able to do that. But I don't want to surpass that. I don't want to be better than them. I just want to better myself as a musician and a composer so that my work is good or improving. And I'm hoping that I push somebody else to want to improve their work as well. And we can together, you know, push forward. But, you know, I, I just reached out to a guy uh, the other day who kind of big lead me. He's like, oh, sorry, man, I'm too busy to to chat about music and things. And he's like, but if you want to collaborate, maybe in a few months, I'm just really busy. And I was like, you don't have to big lead me, man. Just, just, you can just ghost me or you can just be up front. Like, I'm not going to, you know, I'm busy too, but I'm not going to sit here. The busier you say you are, the less busy you really are. Probably. Yeah. Like, you know. I'm not putting him on blast or anything, but uh, it's fine. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not naming names. I've I've reached out to several people who've done that, so it's not like one person. Um, 
and I feel bad for them. Like you're just you're insecure, and and I'm not gonna like make you feel bad about it. But like, yeah, let's just hang out. Let's talk. Let's let's figure out music. Let's. How can I help you? How can you help me? Like, can I push people to your pay your Bandcamp or your Spotify or something? Can you can you reciprocate it? You know, can we can we help each other out? You know? Yeah, I think over the the last year or so, I've started to see what I do and don't love about the guitar community and the people in the guitar community. And I've come to realize that, you know, with any of these communities that I want to build, it's not about a competition, but it's really about, you know, just creating a space where people feel supported and uh, where they feel not to be woo, but I'm woo. So loved, um and 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 and, you know like there's in the guitar community there's just so much competition and there's i mean the scarcity mindset i find myself really often being playing into scarcity and the idea that like oh if i don't do this thing that came into my inbox i'm not going to be able to ever work again in the guitar community and you know this is like this is this constant panic and I'm sure some of that is perpetuated by music school, <laughs> but, um, and like, you know, whatever happens there, but yeah, that's the community I want. And I'm, I'm grateful that, you know, you followed on Instagram <laughs> and then I was like, Oh, I want to talk to this person. And, and, you know, like a lot of the really meaningful relationships that I have now with people have just come from people reaching out or me reaching out and being like, yeah, like we're into the, same thing and like we we want to talk and like hang out and you know we'll see each other in person when the time comes but yeah 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 and it was great because i i try to curate my i the only social i'm on right now is uh instagram lucky like, you. i'm not on facebook or twitter i know like part of me is like i should be because but i don't want to no, i just don't. I, yeah. I quit those um but i try to curate my feed and my friends with like okay who's supportive and uplifting and i found margins guitar collective through somebody sharing it i can't remember who but somebody shared it i was like oh this looks awesome so i clicked on it and i liked it and then like within the day you reached out and I was like, awesome like this is this is a real <laughs> guitar collective that is supportive yeah. and um i always hesitate to use the word inclusive because i i have a love-hate relation i've said love-hate yeah. relationship a lot i love it because it's it's inclusive well, I love and hate it because of this reason. Who or what is including who or what? Right. It points out the power dynamic and the asymmetrical relationship um, where it's like white people are including uh, people of color or men are including women or whatever majority or um, those X in power is including X not in power, um, which is positive that we're acknowledging it, but negative because we're acknowledging it. We can't find a term that kind of dismantles it. Anyway, right. um, Margin Guitar Collective was, is, it, it was really inspiring that you reached out for that. And so you're looking for guitar community, a, a guitar, to build your own guitar community, uh, it seems like, that's yeah, not crab mentality, scarcity mentality. Um, tell me, can you tell me more about, I mean, we, we've had conversations about this. I'm sure you've said it before on. Line. Yeah. No, it's funny you bring up the inclusive thing because when I was starting to think about and, and formalize in the way that it is now, the mission of the collective, I was like, you know, we're trying to build this inclusive guitar community. And then I've come to, again, to, to like you not really love that word. And I don't know if it was because I've heard it it's so much, word. but it's the word. Yeah, it's, it's the, the word, word you have to use. And so yeah, I don't yeah. hate it. I just, it's what you have to use right now. Right. It's, it's people understand it. Yeah, you know, it's for better it's or for worse. The current phrase. Right. And there's right. nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And I've started to think about Do you know the brand Fubu? It mm -hmm. it was like this, you know, it's like late 90s, early 2000s. For us by us. Yeah, right. That's what I want. I want a community for us by us. And us is like whoever us is, you know, we don't have to define us. But I'm sure that it's easy to define us, you know, like the kind of people who uh, in the name who have been marginalized from the mainstream guitar community 
sometimes because and oftentimes because of their uh, identity, but sometimes too because of their artistic choice, right? There are some things that you and I do as artists and that other people do, the art that we create that the mainstream community does not like and and they're never going to and they're never going to accept it and that's fine so i'm going to go over here and i'm going to i'm going to be in this group i'm going to have this community of people who celebrates the work and the art and the individual that you know i am and that i do and that's that's what i want and and not because i feel a need to be included in the guitar community although it's like yeah i mean you should be inclusive um but now it's like okay that doesn't matter but i still want community <laughs> you know because i really believe that community is important i'm an only child and i love it but i'm also looking for community <laughs> and i need friends you know <laughs> you know and so that's kind of that's kind of also part of it, it selfishly is you know wanting that um, but yeah, FUBU for us by us is, is, is it. I was just thinking about FUBU the other day. I, I'm not going to lie. I was thinking about like <laughs> all those like nineties, uh, clothing, like cross colors, FUBU and mm -hmm. I don't know, Jinko jeans. I never had a pair of Jinko jeans, but I had a bunch of friends that had, I had an off brand pair that were just awful. They were like, they were like five bucks or like 10 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> they were just, <laughs> just terrible. Um, that was, yeah, sorry. So yeah, that makes me happy to hear. Cause I mean, we've had these conversations before about like creating a community that we can serve and that serves us for mm -hmm. us by us. Right. Yeah. Um, how do you see that evolving and, and off when we're done with recording, I, I have a proposal for you that I've been thinking about for Ooh, like can't wait. a few weeks and I'm like trying to formulate it, but I think I'm kind of I'm like 75% there. Um, <laughs> And maybe we'll get like 80% there when we, when we talk. Okay. But like, what are you thinking about like, not like five-year plan or something, but like moving forward, where do you see that guitar community existing? Because it, it can exist online and it can exist. Uh, I don't know. I mentioned in one of our conversations, uh, the book Glitch Feminism by Legacy Russell. Yeah, it's on my TV. And, and she, uh, she says uh, not uh, in real life or or uh, offline, she says, away from keyboard, AFK, which was like the old instant messenger, like uh, lingo that we probably both used at <laughs> yeah. some point. Um, so like, our, how can it exist online and AFK? Is that the right acronym, AFK? Yeah, AFK. Yeah, yeah. So it will exist both uh, on AFK and online. Um, and how that looks, you know, I don't really know, but I think it looks like, this is the best way could like pop up concerts and like pop up opportunities, uh, but also opportunities like we're going to do a listening party and for people to like promote their own work and for people to also feel like, hey, I want to I want to do this project. Can you support in, in some way? So that could that could be financial support, but it could also just mean like promotional support or emotional support because sometimes you need a person to just like you know validate your idea and so i think that's what it is going to look like in the future it, it's really hard to tell because the pandemic in my mind is not over but it's in not. the minds of so many it is and so how do you manage a, an artistic organization in, in that space, you know, I have no idea and no, and no one does. We're all just kind of figuring it out now. And so I think, yeah, the space uh, that it'll occupy in the future is kind of online and away from the keyboard in these small, really intentional spaces and times. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And, um, I'm glad you mentioned the pandemic's not over for you because it's not over for me yet. <laughs> I just had a guy walk in to look at uh, something in, 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 in the house and he made a big stink about not wearing a mask. And so I was like, oh, all right. He's like, well, I, I'm vaccinated. And I was like, whatever. It's just like, I'm going to be in the other room completely away from you. Just come on in and look. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like he, It's over for him. It's not, I don't know if it ever started for him. I feel like it didn't start for him. For some people, it's, it's, yeah, it didn't. Yeah. It never started. Yeah. Um, it's, it's funny you bring that up. You know, the other day at work, I got an email from someone who 
calls himself a doctor of some sort. I don't know, you know, what that is, but you know, doctor. So I'm going to take it for what it is. And they were like, you know, I was watching the concert the other day uh, because at my job, we promote concerts and produce them. And he was saying that his son, who was one of the performers, had to wear a mask. And all the performers, if they were a quartet, they had to wear masks because that was just what we're doing. And he was like, you know, why put that extra strain on performers? And after all, you live in Texas and whose stupid idea was that? And I was just like, I am just the lowly development officer here. Like, what did I do to to ignite this in you? And then I responded, you know, in my very development officer i'm representing this organization way and you know it's just like we're just trying to keep everyone safe and his res- he responded back and he was like oh yeah you know i appreciate your kevin response <laughs> is it the, is karen and kevin, kevin, kevin yes you? yeah he did yeah and i was like the pandemic is not over like it's 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 sure in a lot of places it's um improving yeah but and, and you know i read that Someone said that we're going from a pandemic to an endemic and it'll just be something that we continue to live with. And it's yeah. like, that's, uh, you know, what it is, but we're still in a pandemic. It's in, in selfishly for both of us, it's really affecting our stability and yeah. our, you know, my income. Cause I mean, the majority of my income came from in-person stuff, whether it be like face-to-face meetings or from performing um, I mean, I've gigged theater gigs since um, the pandemic started in in socially distanced ways, and I've done uh, some like live stream concerts and stuff where people are generous enough to to like donate. You know, there's right. there's it's really hard to kind of like it's not hard to ask for for a ticket, but it, you know, it's it's just donations are better because <laughs> it's like people should be able to enjoy. I believe in arts accessibility and and you know, um, art should be accessible to everyone. Mm -hmm. And that includes people that might not have $5 to give at the door, but if they do great, if they have 10, great. If they have 20, awesome, please. Uh, but yeah, AFK and IRL or no, AFK and, and, uh, virtual like online stuff. I, I feel like it's, it's going to continue. And I feel like if I'm being honest, the majority of the music that I consume anyway is Spotify, YouTube, Bandcamp, those right, three main right. platforms and some other, you know, things that are only available in certain things. But even before the pandemic, like, to be honest, the majority of the music I consumed that I'm not like practicing or performing my own by my, myself was digital. So how do we lean into that and move that forward? Going back to the music school discussion of how do you prepare you for the real world when, to be honest, most of the people running these music schools and being professors existed at a time when when that was wildly different and they're giving you career advice. I had one guy tell me, he's like, just walk in the door with your resume and, and give it to the, and I'm like, you can't do that anymore. There's like hundreds <laughs> oh of people applying for an adjunct position. Right. It pays like 3000 per course if you're lucky. And, and I'm like, I'm not going to walk in the door with my CV and resume and like blank cover letter. And just like, you want to hire me? You got, you got to get like, I'll do it. I'll send a casual email, but it's not going to, it's not really going to get me anything. It's just, no. I did my due diligence. I've paid my way. Um, yeah, we need to prepare people for life past the pandemic and life in the last like 25 years, mm-hmm. 30 years, you know, like it's just, our music systems are so outdated and they're becoming, um, just to, to circle back to this, they're becoming preservationist societies. When we see a lot of Ooh. like folk music and, um, you know, I, I enjoy like a good classic, uh, like early blues, traditional blues or something, um, preservationist performer that's playing in the style and singing in the style of that. And that's the goal. They're not trying to do something new and inventive. They're trying to preserve this and showcase it because live music is very special or even like recorded music by a living person is very special and playing like Robert Johnson songs are great, but the music conservatory system is just obsessed with Bach, Brahms and Beethoven. (laughs) And it's this preservation of society. And again, going to like decolonizing when neither of us look like dead white European cishet men. um, And all we study and all we're we're told is good is music by dead European cishet white men. We can't, I can't hold up. And so when you 
when you ask the average person in the United States to close their eyes and picture a composer, what do they see? Probably that Beethoven thing where he's, you know, the the image. The and then bus, like, okay, yeah. picture a living composer. Close your eyes. Some white dude with glasses, probably kind of <laughs> crazy. I'm I'm not lying. You know, I mean, I'm painting with a broad brush, but you I are, mean, but it's it's probably broad, relatively broad. accurate. Um, mm -hmm. People don't know what living composers look like, and. The people being promoted right now, I'll, I'll ask people in music school, name one Asian American composer, name one uh, Latinx American composer, name one um, you know, black composer, name a woman composer. Can you name five? If you can name one, can you name five? If you can name five, can you name 10? Can you name six? The answer is no, even for like doctoral students, even some involved in contemporary music where they're mostly playing contemporary music, and again, you're probably looking at higher profile people. They might have friends that are of that. Right. Um, but like a household name, I mean, it's just difficult to name. And that's a positive and a negative. It's like, okay, it's positive because we're identifying the problem as negative because there's a problem. How do we move forward with this? So this ties in with how do you build the for us, by us community for guitar, for new music specifically, because you're dealing with mostly contemporary music, not a preservationist society, you know? Like we're playing music of the Civil War era, like European music of that era. And, you know, I live in a city that still has Confederate monuments up and it's just like awful. <laughs> like I see those and I'm like, oh, this place sucks. Um, and so like hearing that music, I'm like, I connect with it because everyone will flaccidly say like, oh, music is the universal language. Yeah. But we're not walking around talking in the same dialect as William Shakespeare. Right. So we have to update it. You know, I'm not going to speak like, like somebody from the 18 teens. So let's update the music too. And let's value the music and value the people making it, which is much more diverse than ever before, at least right. in the Western world. I mean, in other parts too, but I don't know where we're, I don't know. I, I've been really bad at like derailing us. No, it's great. It's, 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 <laughs> no, it's good. I'm glad you, you talked about, um, again, the, the decolonizing aspect of of all of this and also kind of what you do and that's what i really wanted to talk to you about uh you know is is like when you say decolonizing the musical self or decolonizing my musical self what what do you mean by that so that um there's there's a book by ejr david called uh, brown skin white minds and i really love that book it's specifically about filipino american uh identity and I've just been drawing a lot from that recent in the last four or five years since it came out. But I've been thinking about this since I was like a kid. And there is this positive or negative or neutral, I guess, ethnic identity associated in the culture we live in. And the culture that we live in, the power structure serves and exists by and for, for them, by them, uh, white, predominantly patriarchal systems like white men. Uh, heteronormative systems, white, cis, men. Um, nothing wrong with it. Don't hate the player, hate the game. The system is funneling everything for that, with exception, but mostly for that. And so when we take these positive ethnic identity tests, and there's some tests in the book that are really cool, where it's it's like you fill in fill in the, the blank, like, um, like fill in the words, you fill in a couple letters. And so at the end... Um, you'll have like a, a right column and a left column. And in the right column, it'll be like all the Filipino stuff. So it'll be like Filipino with a couple letters missing, but it's clearly you fill in Filipino and you fill in Brown and you fill in uh, Asian, you fill in like uh, Eastern. And on the left column, it's like, uh, what is this? Like American, white, all of these other things that are, that are similar. And at the bottom it is blank, 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 E R I. O R. So you have two options in your mind. Cognitively, you either go superior or inferior. Mm. And it's funny that the majority of people, and they have the studies, they have like the, the percentage breakdowns and all of this. I'm not a scientist. So like my terminology is awful or I'm not a psychologist either. So like, it's just layman's terms, but um, it's like the majority of people will put inferior for Brown mm -hmm. Filipino and white American being superior. 
And it's just this cognitive thing. I took it with my partner and that happened and I took it and I was like very aware. So I was like totally an outlier, but I was like <laughs> brown superior. <laughs> I, mean, I, don't, I don't think in that way. Like I don't think Filipino culture is superior. I think it's equal to, I think brown culture, I think Hispanic culture, I think all of these cultures that are historically and currently marginalized, we need to not see as a negative implicit association. And we need to have a positive ethnic identity for ourselves, for us, by us. I love that you brought that up because we need to not see it as an us versus them or a white versus non-white, as a European versus non-European, as an Eastern or Western versus Eastern. We need to see them as equal and part of a whole and we can we can be both. We can exist liminal, liminally in between these two states. And that's how I always posit my music is that uh, I write liminal music that exists in between. My music exists in Asian America, which is not a place that I can draw or point to on a map. It's not a place that you can draw borders around. It's just wherever I'm existing wherever my music is existing. And mm -hmm. it is for Asian American or marginalized peoples, but also for whoever consumes it. Um, but when we have this negative ethnic identity and association, then we devalue ourselves. And we value things like the academy or Western music to the point where we put it on pedestal and we are always looking up at it. And we're never looking at ourselves as being worthy or equal. And we have like imposter syndrome. And then what we do is we code switch. We speak differently when we're trying to interview. We we uh, dress differently. We act differently. We we get rid of customs. We get rid of of styles and things that we that are historically cultural for us. Whether they're good, bad, neutral, they're usually neutral. Like who cares how we are? Who cares all this thing? You know, I had a um, a, a casting director in town. And I'm not looking for like acting jobs or anything, but I was looking for some scoring gigs. And she told me, she's like, well, why don't you just change your name uh, to be more like white? And I was to like, like Josh? Well, no, I or, mean like Josh is a is like an Anglo name, right? Right. But she was like, right. just make your last name Mars, like Bruno Mars. And I was like, whoa, because he's half Filipino, right? And she was like associating. And she's like, you just anglicize your name and then you get the job and they don't care. And I'm like, I shouldn't have to do that, number one. And number two, like you're just you're just playing into it, and you're you're devaluing my culture and my people, which is already a race. It's already colonized, right? Right. My my last name is is Hispanic because we were a Spanish colony for 400 years, but it's pronounced not Spanish or you know style. It's pronounced Marquez, not Marquez, because we were an American colony and American typewriters and typesettings did not have Spanish characters. So there's two levels of erasure with my culture. Um, and I exist in America now. So, uh, but decolonizing allows us to see ourselves as equal or acceptable in a way. And it doesn't devalue Western art. Clearly I went to school for over a decade or the better part of a decade and exist in this white Western, predominantly Western music world. Um, I don't devalue it. I see it as no better or worse. And I see it as music. Um, going back to inclusive, like oftentimes a lot of white composers will make like, it's always like stereotypically Japanese, Chinese sounding <sighs> things. And they'll be like, it's exotic. And I'm bringing the East to the West. And I'm like, just the language in your program note is kind of problematic. And the yeah. fact that you think you're an authority and the fact that you think you're uplifting, you're raising up this like, and they don't say it, but it's kind of implied this like savage Easterner mm -hmm. to this, this learned Aristotle Westerner. And I'm just like, please stop. Just please stop. You know, like, um, but that's where decolonizing allows us to have equal footing. And it's a really tough process that I go through every day. I mean, consciously, subconsciously, I really try to value myself and I try to value others who are in the same boat. You know, I, I did a podcast, uh, with, I did two episodes of a podcast with a guy who was very much in this colonial mindset or this colonial mentality that mm. he was very much like, I want to be white. Um, this Venezuelan guy, this Venezuelan uh, immigrant uh, who came here when he was six, he's like, I really want to be a white guy. And I was like, come on, man, you're better than that. Not because you're better than white, but like you're better than to beat yourself up for it. There's nothing right, wrong right. with liking whatever may be associated with white culture, but like you can't dismiss your, your roots and who you are and who how you are seen, you have to think of yourself positively and decolonize so that you can exist in the world and, 
and be on equal footing with everyone and actually value yourself and not sell yourself short. Uh, don't hate the player, hate the game. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, when we talk about decolonizing, though, I think there is often or there could often be a conversation about like abolition and like what are we abolishing when we decolonize or maybe like like do you have any thoughts on abolition as like a a way of being or a thing that you do or a practice yeah abolition is is a similar word but a different word i think it implies the dismantling of a it's difficult because we're getting into kind of semantic territory, which is fine with me. Uh, when I think about abolition, I think about uh, like prison abolition, like Angela right. Davis takes on that, which is very nuanced and I am not quite articulate enough to, to agree with that. But I, I like to read a lot of Angela Davis thoughts on prison abolition, but also like decolonizing things like Palestine. You right. know, Palestine currently is in an apartheid state. It is in a colonial settler, settler Israel is a colonial settler, settler state. So how do we decolonize that? It's not quite abolition, but it's kind of abolition. I, I don't want to get caught in like those semantics. Um, we're talking about like, you know, in America, we talk about abolition and the first thing that comes to mind for us is, is slavery, I think. Right. Probably. I mean, unless there's something else that we think about first, but that's what I think about. And that was a system that was like, I don't know, I think very different. This is more when we talk about decolonizing, especially like mentality, mm -hmm. it's not like a legislative action. It's a personal social, social and cultural action. Um, and so it's quite different because abolition, I think would apply like a, a, a legislative action versus just like a treatment of things. Although, colonization is was also like the annexing of something but again like we're, we're changing specifically with what i'm talking about with decolonizing right. it's not like we don't have to go to the to, to congress for it <laughs> you just have to look in the mirror and be like brown is okay you know right 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 a process that you kind of like you said go through yourself day after day and are really sometimes conscious but also subconsciously aware of yeah yeah and um how uh i mean and it's it's different from from our backgrounds but like how has that more broad con uh, uh concept of of decolonizing worked for you in the guitar world and in the academic world like it's it's different because our cultures are quite different there, there's a lot of similarities um right i think angela davis actually in one of her lectures was talking about like a, sh a similar history of oppression but on a shared history of oppression right, right. like we get it but we don't get, get it you know yeah, like, yeah. like you don't know what it's like but i don't know what it's like but we know what it's like right right you know? how is um i think that it's taken me a long time to to even like come to that and acknowledge it because for so long i wanted to be recognized by my mostly white peers in the guitar community as one of them. <laughs> and so I was doing nearly everything I could, I thought, to, to be in that space. And I think it's only in the last few years that I've come to, to say like, no, I want to do something different. And what I'm doing should still be valid in your eyes but if it's not it's, it's fine and i'm gonna you know do what i want and so i'm i'm struggling sometimes to find music that i feel like aligns with that i think i'm getting there artistically but it, it's going to take a, lo a lot longer than i probably want it to or uh, assumed that it might and and it's it's interesting too because i've been in a lot of conversations and I know a lot of people who sometimes I feel like what they're trying to create is a recreation of this western classical music canon but just black <laughs> and and that's not really what I want either is that making sense oh I know exactly okay. what you're talking about and I have a feeling I know some of the same people that we might be thinking about not to call like I'm not saying that like we know the same circle of people, right, but like right. I think there's a lot of people right now who are 
occupying that space and i'm like what is actually different though i had one guy and not to interrupt but i had one guy i was a guest at james madison university and there was a visiting composer there on faculty and i'm presenting this decolonization idea this was a few years ago and he raises his hand he was super sweet and he apologized afterward he was like i didn't mean for it to come across this way but uh he said like you're talking about non-western music and decolonizing and liminality but it sounds like western classical music to me and i was like well okay but i was like do you know what filipino music sounds like and he's like no and i was like well we were a western colony and completely obliterated for like 400 plus years so forgive me and i wasn't like this standoffish i'm just i'm being hyperbolic i was like forgive me if i'm (laughs) but you know like we're also living in a global society where the music could sound like that but it's clear it's like are you even as a a racial or, or whatever minority are you um kind of in a way virtue signaling or playing into are you having your identity weaponized right and that is something i'm very much against i'm like be conscious embrace it empower it but do not become a tool for that system to use you and say look we're not racist we we, i don't don't know if you were you saw this news but uh unc uh chapel hill professor did not get tenure oh Uh, my gosh yeah she (laughs) was I mean, Pulitzer Prize Prize winning, MacArthur Fellow. Ridiculous, ridiculous resume. Absolutely stunning. Didn't get it because she's too, they couldn't weaponize her. They couldn't have this passive voice. Um, If you saw that that Netflix, uh, OJ Simpson, The People versus OJ Simpson, Sterling Brown's character had a great line where he goes, you guys want a black face at the table, but not a black voice. And I was like, ooh, 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 that's so good. (laughs) But that's what they want. And so they're being weaponized. And so when we see people, and again, aesthetic doesn't matter, but when we see people playing into this thing and not challenging it and not confronting it, they don't know that they are a tool and being weaponized. And I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but like they're being weaponized. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, I, and I'm like, survival, I get it, do your thing. But at the same time, I'm like, do it, but like be it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like if you want to change it, change it. Don't just show up and half, you know, half heartedly do something. Anyway, sorry to interrupt, but I just got no, no, you, like it, fired me up in a good way. Yeah, no, it's it's great. Uh, it's it's like I see I see people and that I know, and they're like, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna um, we're gonna be this brown group of people, but we're still gonna mostly only play white music. <laughs> it's like, well, that's that's not that's that's not it and you know and then there's like this uh, brown group of people and they're like okay we're gonna play brown music but still in a really the same way as we've always been taught and that we believe and it's like i don't think that's really doing the thing either as as much as we like to to think that it is and so i think i'm trying to do something that's beyond that but it takes a while to to get there and to understand and to to figure that out because i don't know what that looks like there are many examples of what of what or sounds is. like or sounds like right right yeah, yeah it's just not it's just not there yet and so you know i'm in this space of of trying to create it and i think it'll be an artistic practice that i'm i'm always you know creating and on a journey that i'm always on which is which is fine which is kind of the point but you know how that plays out into what i'm playing for my next dma recital is, is kind of not and I don't think because I and I, I want it to be, I, but I feel so much of a constraint uh, time wise, but also the academy. Right. Like I have to place something that my professor will approve of. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm limited. You know, I want to do a work that involves, you know, um, Max Patch and pedals and ele- an electric guitar. And that's just not going to work for him. And yeah, so it's I not it, proven. Right, it's, it's not, not vetted. No, no. So I can't do it. You know, even though that's the art I want to make, even though I feel like that that's worthy to me. That's worthy of a doctorate. But, but yeah, uh, I can't wait to talk know. to you after we 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 stop because we're seeing eye to eye on yeah. so many things. So, um, but, but yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's it has a to challenge. be approved. Yeah, but yeah. who approves it? And that's where we start to see things crumble. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's unfortunate. And so many of us want to be that person that approves, but by the time we jump through the hoops and, you know, we're exhausted and we've had to do all those things, we did desensitize ourselves to this activism. If we want to call it that, I think we should call it that. And we end up being complicit within the system. So we become 
cogs in the system. And uh, we don't see change because we have been beaten into submission. Um, but we need change agents like you. But I, I don't know if academia is going to change, at least no. in my lifetime. Uh, I think it can. I don't think it will. And the people that I'm seeing are being hired. I like a lot of them. They're great human beings. They're not confronting anything. And if they are, it's virtue signaling. Some white dude will, will start a database full of marginalized people and don't even ask me if I want to be on it. And, um, uh, you know, and benefits from it. It's like copyright this person and they make darn well sure that, it sounds so weird to say, they make sure that uh, they uh, are are at front and center on that. And and you look at the committee that's helping with it and it's it looks like a Republican caucus. Just, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. And I work with that group now. And uh, trust me, I acknowledge all of what you just said. You know, I've called it out. And I've, been, I've yeah. been put on blast. And I'm like, you Which can't confront good. that because then you look like it's like, oh, you don't support diversity. It's like, no, I do. You don't. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing. I don't think that I think. Maybe this is what you're saying, and maybe I'm putting words in your mouth. Um, but I don't think that a database, and I've said this many times, is going to change anything. Like like the people, like I the way that people anonymous. think. I do it anonymously. Otherwise, uh, you're colonizing us. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like if your name is front and center and all of your colleagues are front and center and I get an email months after it's created and, and every – a couple a year or two I get an email from it like hey look at what we're doing anonymize it make it anonymous and make it a database and support it and and fund it and do all the good things but if you're going to take credit for it and you're not part of it you're part of the problem even if even if it's net positive and I think if I'm being optimistic I think it's net positive but there's a lot of damage it does you know yeah, yeah. um yeah I just yeah it's it's a white savior complex for sure. It's, yeah, it's Matt Damon yeah. saving all of China. You know, it's, it's, it's Scarlett Johansson in anything. <laughs> uh, I have a shirt that says Scarlett and Emma and Tilda and Matt, and I got it from an, an advocacy group. And it was, it was like 2017 or something. It was all the white people that played Asians in like blockbuster so summer movies. Uh, but yeah, white saviors are, are, are screwing up a lot of progress, I think. For sure. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. So uh, as we kind of kind of, you know, come to the end of our conversation, is there anything that you are excited about that you're looking forward to that you want to share with people who are listening? Um, there's, there's a lot that I'm, I'm trying to do right now. Uh, I'm working on releasing another album potentially this year in the next several months. I haven't, I have the music there. I haven't. And it's got a rough mix and a rough mat. It's not master. It's got a rough mix to it. I just have to finalize everything and then figure out when it's going to be released and all the art and all of that that goes along with it. And then as I'm in a transition process, um, I'm in talks right now with a lot of musicians that I want to collaborate with that will be um, hopefully coming up with, if not casual projects, then long-term projects mm -hmm. that will become more sustainable and be for us and by us. <laughs> um, and, and, and align with my values because I think, yeah, going back to the, the content of this podcast, this episode, um, a lot of things that I've done in the last decade have not aligned with my values, even though I have valued them for what I've gotten out. I don't regret anything, but I need to move on and do something that fulfills me right not only artistically but like ethically and morally and and progressively um and and i need to find a community that does it. and i have a community i mean i have a lot of people like you in my life that are are aligning with that and i'm very thankful for that so uh i guess just be on the lookout for anything that you know I'll s s uh, shameless self-promotion anything that i plug in the future but um yeah i'll I'm trying to move not away from just doing, because I did a lot of guitar stuff. I have two albums of just guitar uh, that don't sound like guitar music, but it's it's like 99% guitar stuff on there. But uh, I'm trying to get more into like 
tape destruction and mm-hmm. synthesizers and analog gear, uh, analog circuitry that that functions in augmenting with the guitar for recorded music. And then for live music, I'm doing a lot of free improvisation um, and stuff like that. No, no specific project that I want to like name right, right now. Right. That's good. Uh, yeah. Just because I haven't finalized it, but it's coming soon. Right. <laughs> Uh, (laughs) well thank you so much for being on this podcast it's been such a joy to get to talk to you and i'm so glad that i was like can you be on my podcast so yeah thank you for having me it's so it's so much fun to do this we've had these like similar conversations i'm glad it's being recorded this time right 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 (laughs) awesome so thank you so much and yeah that's all we got for you for our interview thank you so much to joshua for being on this show Like I mentioned at the top of the show, all of his information will be linked in the show notes. So if you want to take a listen to his music or check out his website, that'll be linked. Since, of course, this is a show about music, I wanted to recommend something for you to listen to. And this week's recommendation is Chivalry is Not Dead by Hiatus Coyote. And they are an incredible band that's that's what we'll call them and i've loved their music for a really long time they just put out an album in the last few weeks so go take a listen and as always it will be linked in the playlist don't forget to follow the podcast on social media and the website there will be a newsletter coming out pretty soon which you can subscribe to where you will receive some updates and additional content about the show if you are listening to this on apple podcasts please give us a like and a rating as it helps to make the show better and it also helps to put the show in front of more people just like you you can also do this directly on the website i believe it is musicallycogitating.com slash review you can always support the show by buying a sticker and a bookmark pack for five dollars and if you'd like you can use our bookshop link to buy a book for yourself at no cost extra to you we get a little bit of a commission from that so that's all i have for you today i will be back in two weeks with the next episode of the musically cogitating podcast until then